And there was a question while we were on break, can you go to uh, Greek Fest? Can you go to the Renaissance Festival? Um, and the answer is yes, if you're extremely critical, if you apply what you've learned in this class and, you, and you're very critical of looking at the Greek festival or the Italian festival and criticize it from what you know about ancient history, okay, you can use it, but with care, okay, don't swallow everything whole and say, oh, yes, this is all right, but be critical according to what you know. Okay, now we're going to, I'm in a little bit of a hurry because uh, I was slower than I thought I would have been on the front, uh, on the first part. But um, we looked, in our first lecture tonight, we looked at Athens and Sparta and we saw them as two opposite expressions of the same values. Greek values are equality, individualism, and the good of the citizen. The individual and the community all are equals and all serve the community. So they're the same values, but they're applied in very different ways. Now, the age that we looked at, the Athenian age of the Athenian Empire, is a classic age, a golden age of Greek culture. And what do we mean when we say classic or golden age? What made the fifth century BC a classic age? Well, part of it was balance, harmony, confidence, optimism. It was a time of great creative of growth. It's also a time of science and tragedy. There's a common ground between Greek science and tragedy because both are asking philosophical questions. What is the nature of the universe and what is the role of man in the universe? And many of the early science were actually philosophical and speculative. For example, Pythagoras in the 6th century BC invented geometry, but he was also the founder of a religion. He was a mystical speculator. Thales of Miletus in the 6th century BC in Asia Minor developed theories of evolution and geologic change based on reason and theory rather than observation, so that the early scientists were speculative and theoretical. We call them scientists because they investigated the natural world. They asked natural questions and they posed natural answers. Okay, The Greeks asked natural questions. Um, they acted on a premise of an orderly universe that could be discovered by man through speculation and through reason. And the Greek tragedians were also seeking order. The origins of the drama were in religious festivals and the inventor was Thespis, who is credited with the traditional birth of drama, the interaction of actors with a chorus. The playwrights of the fifth century were still writing for religious festivals and what they did were to retell the old stories of the Iliad and the Odyssey and Greek myths and they recognized them as myths but they told them in the context of their change values. Remember that we saw Greece go through an enormous change in the kinds of values it had and so the Greeks recognized that the old stories were different from the current life in the Golden Age. The Greek tragedians transformed these old stories by infusing the myths with the great questions of their own day and this created theater. The great um, the great playwrights of the 5th century were Aeschylus, Sophocles, and Euripides, and they all used the old Mycenaean stories, the old individualistic values were pitted against the new cooperative values of the new Greek state. And here's the theater at Athens, again built into a natural hillside. Here's a theater complex where these great um, uh, plays were worked out. Here is Sophocles, Euripides, and Aristophanes, the three great playwrights. Uh, the old values were pitted against the new values. Remember when we had the story of the Iliad, Agamemnon sacrificed his daughter Iphigenia on the way to Troy. Okay, what do you think his wife thought when he came back home. Clytemnestra, his wife, was very upset that uh, uh, Agamemnon had sacrificed his daughter. When he returned home, he was killed by his wife Clytemnestra, who had allied herself with um, Agamemnon's brother Creon. And so 
their two children, Orestes and Electra, were then very outraged and upset, and they took revenge for their father's murder by killing Clytemnestra. So now justice is done, right? The murderer, the murder is avenged, and order has returned to the world, right? Do you all agree with that? Orestes and Electra avenge the murder of their father by killing Clytemnestra, and now justice has returned to the world. Do you all agree with that? Justice is done? Nobody's answering. It depends on how you look at justice. Okay, why? What's, uh, what do you think about that? I mean, Clytemnestra had an affair with, you know, um, She killed her husband. She killed her husband. Okay. And her children, I mean, you know, they took revenge and they killed, you know, they avenged, you know, their father's death. But at the same time, it's, I mean, their whole family was, <laughs> they had all these evils. There was incest going on and yep. killing yep. each other. So justice is very, I don't know, kind of subjective. Look at that other well, right. Well, what, you're, what it boils down to is when Orestes and Electra killed Clytemnestra, they killed their mother, you know. So you can't say it's all right to kill your mother, uh, even if you're avenging your father's death. So what we've got is a ready-made tragic situation. The situation is just a tragedy. There's no justice. There can be no justice. Orestes and Electra, they, according to Greek law, they must avenge their father's death. But to avenge their father's death and do good, they have to do the horrible evil of killing their mother. And this is not justice either. So there's a breakdown of order. And this is what the Greeks were examining. They were asking the question, what is justice? There's no indication in the myth, myth itself that the gods have any obligation. The gods are not involved in this story. So, so the, the Greeks themselves are questioning what is justice, just like Job did when we looked at the book of Job. So why do the Greeks start to pose these questions? Well, um, we'll let's see, we looked at that. Because a commercial class presumes certain values, we've seen the rise of these cooperative values uh, that replace the old competitive values. The myths portray the gods and heroes as not having these values, and so the tragedians reinterpret the myths in light of their own and their own new values. And what we have is the raising of eternal questions. Okay, another example uh, is the play Oedipus Rex. Oedipus's father is told by an oracle that the son his wife expected would murder his father and marry his mother. Okay, so, so Oedipus, when the baby was born, they abandoned him. They actually sent him out to be killed, but he was abandoned. Somebody found him, another king found him, and raised him in another sea, city. And when Oedipus grew up, he heard the prophecy that was made about him when he was a child. And so he left his foster home in order not to fulfill it. Remember, he was prophesied to murder his father and marry his mother. So he left home. He left his foster parents. He went out adventuring. And lo and behold, he met his father on the road, another king. He went to battle with him. He killed him. And he married the king's wife. And he fulfilled the prophecy. He killed his real father and he married his mother. Not knowing his parents, he fulfilled the prophecy. Okay, and his mother's name was Jocasta. He had four children by her. The play takes place all in one day, the day he finds out the truth that he has actually murdered his father and killed his mother. Okay. Is Oedipus guilty? He's done this terrible crime. He's killed his father. He's committed incest with his mother. Should he be punished? What do you think? As the tragedians took it up, Sophocles asked the existential question of unwittingly doing wrong. Okay, what is the source of evil? Why do we unwittingly do wrong? And is it a crime if we do something without knowing that we've done it? 
there's a different answer that the Greeks pose, that there is an underlying cosmic order. A sense of justice is infused in the myth. The gods are just and things are working justly. The end of the story is that Oedipus blinds himself and Jocasta commits suicide. So there is justice, the crimes are atoned for. But there's a sequel to that story and the, the second play is Oedipus at Colonna. He then wanders the world blind with his daughter as his guide and he ends up his life an old man um, going to the city of Colonna with his daughter and there he's honored at his death. He's older and wiser. So there's a sense of justice and mercy. Okay, compare that to Aeschylus who tells the story, who tells the Orestia. In the Orestia, which is the story about Orestes and what happens to him after he kills his mother, Orestes is chased by the Furies who are outraged by what he's done when he killed his father and they pursue him to the ends of the earth and when he gets to the ends of the earth there's a great court trial and Athena the goddess of wisdom comes and she casts the deciding vote. Uh, Orestes is not to be punished because he, he committed this crime uh, because he committed this crime trying to do justice. This upgrades the story to a higher level of justice. The Furies will temper their wrath in the future. So there's a premise of universal laws that govern both the gods and men. And like the scientists, the, the thespians believe these laws could be discerned by men. There's one more play we might look at, and it's the one you've read. This is the story of Antigone. Uh, the other children of Oedipus are Antigone, Polynikes, Ismene, and Edocles, another brother. Okay, Creon, remember he's the king that was uh, having an affair with Clytemestra. Creon is now the king of Thebes, and H Haman is his son. The two brothers of uh, Antigone, Polynikes and Edocles, are divided. Polynikes rebels and gets and raises an army outside the city and attacks the city. His brother Edocles defends the city for Creon. Polynikes is killed attacking the city and Creon, the king, forbids his burial. Whoever buries Polynikes will be executed. Okay. Now Antigone is his sister. Antigone insists on doing her family duty by giving Polynikes a proper burial and her sister Ismene stays with her. Antigone is engaged to Creon's son Hymen who then commits suicide because Antigone insists on burying Polynikes. Now if she gives Polynikes a proper burial, she's going to be killed because the law, the Creon has said whoever buries him is going to be killed. The play is a debate between Antigone and Creon, okay? Who is in the right in this debate? Who do you think is right, Antigone or Creon? Antigone wants to bury her brother because it's the rule that the, of the family that a sister must bury her brother okay, and give him a proper burial. Okay. Creon says, no, he can't be buried. Throw him outside the walls to be eaten by the dogs. Okay. Be, who, who is right? I think it would be Antigone because in the beginning she says to her sister Ismene mm -hmm. that if you don't help me I'm going to go and bury him anyway and if I have to die for it I will die for it. Yes, but she's I willing will. to die for it yeah. because it's she's duty bound to bury her brother. Doesn't, Ke doesn't Creon have any right on his side at all? I mean if she's right to bury her brother what about Creon? Does, does he have, is he just a cruel and horrible king or does he have a reason for saying you can't bury him? Well, I think maybe it shows some different um, 
values than we would be, be able to recognize because since Polynices did rebel against him, he has a right to hold that grudge probably, but in modern time all we see is Creon being kind of like a tyrant that's holding a grudge and begrudging this against a woman that's trying to bury her brother. Okay, we tend to take the individualist side that as an individual and, and we, we look at um, Antigone and we kind of take her side, but Creon has right on his side. He's the king of the city and Polynices is a traitor. He's attacked the city and he's tried to conquer it. He's a traitor who tried to conquer the city from Creon and Creon is the constituted ruler of the city. So he has right on his side too and he has a good reason because if you give traitors a, a proper barrier then everybody will be encouraged to go ahead and, and, and rebel against the designated authority, the rightful authority of the city. So what have we got? Oh, you, you've got it on it. But, uh, I mean, in the beginning, he could have been a better arbitrator and say that, okay, these two brothers are not going to fight because it started when the brothers were like, okay, you, you're going to rule this much and I'm going to rule this much. And one of them was like, when he got the throne, he was like, no, I'm going to stay. And Creon could have been like, okay, guys, you, you know, your time is up. But he didn't do that. But he didn't do that. Okay, remember the playwrights had the stories. The stories are already written. They're myths that have been there for hundreds of years. You can't change the story. You have to take the story and explain why things happened the way they did. And so that's, that's, that's the tragedy. You know, these things happen, but now they're looking at them and they have different ideas. So what has happened is, what Antigone represents is the old family law of the aristocracy, the old law of the family. And what Creon represents is the new law of the city, the new kind of democratic law. It's the law of the, um, uh, the nomos physos controversy, natural law against man-made law. So Creon represents a new man-made law, whereas Antigone represents the natural law of nature in the family. Yeah. I think that play is really useful actually for questioning how useful is it to hold on to any kind of value like that, um, you know, relentlessly, because in the end nobody wins. I mean, Creon ends up by himself. His wife has killed himself because his son killed her himself, you know, so nobody wins at all. And it was just right. because everybody decided that they were going to stick to their guns. And so it's a good way to question in every, you know, section of society and every, you know, individual example, should you be sticking to your guns or should, can you make exceptions and stuff like that. Exactly. And, but, but can you see how, how what you're describing is an individualistic answer that you're, you're standing up for the rights of the individual. But in Greek society, they're, they're, they're torn between the rights of the community, which Creon represents, the rights of the city to make laws for itself, and the rights of the individual to stand fast for individual law. And you're right, it's a tragedy. And that's, that's where the lesson comes in, that it's a tragedy. And how do you explain this? But, but what happens, why this tragedy takes place is because of the clash between the natural law and the new man-made law that we now see the Greeks making for themselves when they create democracy. Okay. And all of this arises, uh, so it's a debate. These plays are a debate. And all of this arises because of the Athenian Enlightenment. How did the Greeks come to think this way? It's because of the Athenian Enlightenment and because they start to apply reason to their society. The results of the effects of war on the social fabric of the state, the Peloponnesian War are terrible damage, psychological damage created by prolonged war. Propaganda, the propaganda of the wars makes people cynical. They don't believe what their leaders say anymore. Does that sound familiar? Uh, an example of the propaganda is Pericles' funeral oration, which com and compare that to the treatment of the allies in the Melian Dialogue, which you also read. And so they're both propaganda. We have the, the propaganda we have from the wars the brutalization of a generation, which coincides with the development of the fifth century and the rise of democracy. And when 
democracy rises up, we have the re-emergence of the individual and it creates even more conflict, okay? Because now, just as we've said in our discussion today, we recognize the rights of the individual and that's what democracy does. It makes you recognize the rights of the individual. Socrates posed the question of who are you to Gorgias? And this is a question of individualism. When you ask a person who are you, this asks them to identify themselves. In the Enlightenment, answers are consciously sought through the powers of reason rather than myth. And what happens is there's a sense that all the shackles have been thrown off and the Greeks are more willing to ask forbidden questions as a result of this. Contact with other human, with other civilizations makes questions arise. For example, Xenophon of Colophon, Xenophanes of Colophon, 570 to 480 BC, um, uh, observed of other civilizations, people make gods in their own images. What he did was go out and look at all the different civilizations and say, people who were non-Greeks, and they said, people make gods in their own images. Critias says, a wise and clever man invented fear of the gods for mortals, that there might be some means of frightening the wicked, even if they do anything or say or think it in secret. Hence he introduced the divine. And what he said is, men invented religion to control people. Okay, so he's applying reason. Conclusion is that the same process that we can use to build up our knowledge and our arguments can also be used to tear it down. And here they're tearing down religion. And what happens is the Greeks throw out the gods. Archilochus of Paris, 680 to 640 BC, was a mercenary soldier. He invented every kind of poetry, but when he invented new kinds of poetry, he threw all the old poetry out. So you can use reason to build things up or you can use them to tear things down. It's also an acid that, that destroys the good with the bad. Uh, there are certain other changes. The state is asserting its identity in opposition to the family. Okay, remember that Solon uh, proposed property versus birth for prestige. Uh, the play Antigone pits one set of rights and obligations against another. There are new feelings that the laws of the city and natural laws are not identical. And the growth of democracy is the growth of man-made law. And with the growth of democracy, there's a growth of public speaking that's important for political power. Democracy means you have elections and you have public speakers. That's essential for a career in politics. So we see the invention of rhetoric, which is used by the sophists, a whole class of people, and the sophists are seen as possessing women. The sophists taught a course in political science, and it's a course in making a trade out of the practice of justice, how to bend the laws, how to make the best argument for your case. That's what the sophists did, and that's what the rhetoric is. It's, and you want, you want a lawyer to do that for you. The lawyer makes the best case for you, like a modern lawyer. Rhetoric is collecting your thoughts to make a case convincing, okay? The result is that people were going around making speeches, making the worse appear the better case. It's the art of the half-truth, okay? Making a case for your side and not necessarily looking at the truth. This had the effect of making people doubt everything. So the tendency is then to deny the validity of all the laws. And so we have the rise of people who make statements like Protagoras of Abdera, man is the measure of all things. This is a statement of relativity. Gorgias of Leontini said, reality is really unknowable. This means there is no truth. This had the effect of making people doubt everything and deny the validity of laws. It's a recognition that there are limits to what human beings can know, and it can also mean a kind of relativity. Critias in the Syphysis said, religion is the opiate of the masses. And Lysander said, you use dice to cheat boys and oaths to cheat men. There's a feeling 
that one can do what one pleases, that there are no limits. And this is what happened in Ma Athens. For the first time, the aristocrats, the best people, were frozen out of the government. And these are the men who can afford to go to the sophists. The aristocrats and the sophists come up with the conclusion that laws are made, that laws which make naturally inferior men rule are contrary to nature. Um, and so everything is breaking down. as an utter breakdown of moral convention, and Diogenes went out with his lantern every night searching for an honest man, and he never found one. It was at this juncture that Socrates appeared. Okay. Socrates lived from 469 to 399 BC. He was caught up in the intellectual movements of the day and he changed the direction of philosophy. He actually invented the word philosophy, philosophia, which means a friend of wisdom. He asked the question, how should we behave? And the focus is on man. There are rules for man's behavior, not from the gods, but from man's own devising. What he invented was ethics. Ethics is a man-made code of behavior, and Socrates undertook a systematic study of ethics. He took the tools of the sophist, logic, to combat the amoral relativism of the sophist. And his tool was dialectic, which is a question and answer between a teacher and a student. Well, why was Sophocles brought to trial? He was accused by the, pe by the people of Athens of corrupting the youth and uh, arguing against democracy and against relativism, and he was. He would go around on street corners and question young men, and he would, he would actually question them about what is the truth and what is right and what is good. He said he did all this as his duty to the god Apollo, and he actually was guilty. He was corrupting the youth. He was anti-democratic. He said that there are higher laws than just the majority vote, and he would stand up for what he believed in the face of everything. Okay? He wrote, or actually Plato wrote the Apologia, which is his defense or response. Socrates says he speaks for the god Apollo, a symbol of higher laws, that there are universal laws of truth, justice, good, and beauty. Socrates is given the chance to go into exile. He can leave the city of Athens, or he has the choice to drink the hemlock, and he drinks the hemlock as, an, as obedience to the universal laws of truth and justice and good and beauty. Well, Socrates had a student. His student was Plato, who lived from 427 to 348 BC. Plato grew up during the Peloponnesian War and during the ideas of the Enlightenment in a time of great change and great turmoil, when all the assumption of Greek life were breaking down and were being thrown away, and he was swayed by the arguments to throw out democracy. But he saw the debacle of the 30 tyrants who ruined the city of Athens, and he rethinks the concept of the best, not by birth nor by wealth, but by merit. He comes to different conclusions. At first, he reconciled himself to democracy and sought to serve it, but withdrew at the death of Socrates. He founded the Academy in 388 BC, which remained open until 529 BC. And he witnessed a state torn apart by class interest. The fabric of the community was being destroyed by civil wars between the rich and the poor. And what was happening was individualism was running rampant. It was every man for himself. So what Plato tried to do was to recreate the idea of identification of the individual and the community. What he was trying to do was restore community values. And to do this, he wrote a book known in Greek as the Politeia. The Latin name is Res Publica. In English, we call it the state. But the, um, the subtitle is On Justice. 
What is the Republic? It's the first utopia. It's a state with three classes based on ability, not on birth or wealth. The three classes are the craftsmen, who are all people who work with their hands in day-to-day -day things, financiers as well as plumbers. The second class is the guardians, the men and women who, with high qualities, emotional and psychological, f trained for the defense and preservation of the state. And the third class, the ruling class, is of the philosopher kings who were died, denied material rewards or contact with gold and silver. They were subject to selective breeding and practiced chastity except for one day a year. And the products of these unions were raised in common with no knowledge of their parents so they could more easily be put in the proper class. And so what happens is a lot but by merit and not by wealth. Okay, he comes up with the concept of the noble lie. And the noble lie is that the people of the state of the Republic would be told that there are three races of men corresponding to, to the three divisions of the state. These are men of gold, silver, and iron and brass. And there must be a legend created that if men of iron and brass ever become king, the state will fall. Okay. Does any of the system sound familiar to you? Does it anything like anything we've looked at before? No, recognize it. You, do you recognize it? It sounds a little bit like the caste system, but not like um, by necessarily by birth. It's merit based. Yeah. It's more like Sparta. It's actually modeled on Sparta. It's very much like Sparta in the military system. Uh, Plato has taken the Spartan constitution and idealized it. So many of the, so it, it's very much like the state of Sparta. Plato is fighting a rear guard action. He's trying to adapt the ideas of the polis to the new ideas of individualism and bring order out of the chaos of the fifth century. He writes the laws, a specific constitution for the republic, and the main principle of the laws is rigid conformity to the truth. Okay, because there have been so many lies through the whole society that now the new law becomes the law of rigid conformity to the truth. Anybody who challenges the truth must be put to death. Okay, why is this book a classic and a cornerstone of democracy? Because the subtitle was On Justice. And the real question that he's asking is, what is justice? Now, the Greeks up to this time, such as Thysimachus, would answer, justice is the interest of the stronger. Plato's answer was that a good man can only exercise laws for the good of others. Justice is everyone doing his duty to the gods and man and everyone receiving his due. Okay. Does this sound familiar? Does this sound like anything you know about? Everyone doing his duty and everyone reserving his due to each according to his needs and from each according to his ability. It's, it's an early version of communism, what was later called communism. Well, why is this the foundation of, of uh, Plato? Why is this the foundation of democracy? Because Plato is asking, why is it better to be just than to be unjust? Okay. And his answer is, we must define justice in terms of ourselves. Doing bad to others is bad in our own eyes. Okay, Plato turns Greek values upside down. Compare this to Achilles, who represents a shame society where all that matters is what people think of you from what they see by your outer actions. This is looking inward. What matters is the inner man and what you think about yourself. The corollary is there's a one-to-one -one relationship between the state and the individual. The state is the individual writ large, and the state is the ideal form of the individual. The point of the republic is to find justice in the individual, and justice exists in the state when each individual performs the function to which he is best suited. 
in the well-ordered state, reason must rule. And because of Plato, a wise man is now defined as a man who makes ideals, whereas before, a wise man was a practical man of politics. So this is why the change takes place. Okay, this moral breakdown in society, Plato did not succeed. Nobody adopted what he said. I mean, he was a voice in the wilderness because Greek society was utterly breaking down and nobody paid attention to him. Here is, here is um, Socrates, here's a picture of Socrates, and here is the death of Socrates drinking the hemlock. This is the Plato's Academy, closed in 529 by the Emperor Justinian. Okay, and uh, back here. And sorry. Oh, I did something wrong. Sorry. I had this set up and I messed it up. <laughs> okay. Now, out of this breakdown, there's a new order to society. And this is the rise of Alexander the Great and the creation of a new world order in Hellenistic Greece, a hero becomes a god. Okay. Here is the individualism of the Greek city-states. Remember that we, we're, we're dealing with a very limited world, this very small area of Greece, and where individualism is running rampant. Okay. And the Greeks, when we looked at, at Greece, it was a limited drama on a limited stage. Uh, and the core culture of the Greeks was the Indo-Europeans. Uh, we might compare the Iliad and the Odyssey to the Mahabharata and the Ramayana in India. Okay. Uh, and here is a ballot. Democracy is ruled by the people. And here's a ballot for ostracism. Uh, the creation of the Athenian Empire and colonization and the rise of reason. We just looked at that. Athens, the golden age of Athens. Okay. And we mentioned realism or idealism and Greek art as more idealistic. Okay. Were the Greeks searching for order, or are we looking at the breakdown of order? Well, we're looking at both. Under Plato, we have the breakdown of order. The Greek historians are Herodotus and Thucydides, the, the, um, uh, which we read. We read uh, readings from both of them. Are these the origins of history? Uh, well, yes, a certain kind of history, the kind that the, Greek wrote, the Greeks wrote. But we've already looked at the Bible as a kind of history as well. We've taken our ideas of history from the Greeks. The major function of the historian is to determine causality. The ancients believed that people or fate caused history. They believe that great individuals make history happen and change the course of history. But modern historians look to social and economic sources, forces. Modern historians see history from the bottom up, and the causation is trends, great impersonal forces like economic or social forces make all of these changes. The example is that Marxists uh, uh, Marxists portray history as a class struggle, and now history is being seen as a race and gender struggle, okay? So that modern historians tend to see forces as causing history, whereas the ancients saw great individuals, great men causing history. So the question we have is, did Alexander the Great make history, or did history make Alexander great? Okay. Was Alexander a great man who made history? 
Well, he didn't appear in a vacuum. Okay, the Greek world was very small. Here's the Greek world. Compared to the Persian Empire, the Greek world is very small. But Alexander was a, an individual who indeed did change the world. When Plato developed his theory of forms and the allegory of the cave, the Republic, the fourth century was working out the effects of the Peloponnesian War. The assumptions of the classical world were breaking down and change was happening at a great um, pace of change. Plato had another student, Aristotle, who came up with opposite interpretations of the way the universe worked. Where Plato looked at the general or the theory of forms, the general, and derived the particular from it, in other words, Plato would say that Reality is a great model uh, that exists in the universe and all individuals are imperfect representations of that model. In other words, take cats. Uh, in the world of the universe there is a perfect cat and all the different individual cats we see which are black and white and long haired and short haired and and gray and striped and so on. Each of these are imperfect uh, reflections of that perfect cat who exists outside of the ordinary world. Okay, so we have a general form and we derive the particular from it. Aristotle, his student, had the opposite idea. Aristotle looked at the particular individual instances and arrived general laws from it. And in other words, if Aristotle wanted to know what is the essence of cat, he would not look for the perfect cat in the universe. He would look at a whole bunch of individual cats, and from those individuals, the sum total of them, he would derive what is the perfect cat. Okay? That's the scientific method, isn't it? That's the way we think today. Aristotle, again in this, this age of great creative thinking, of great chaos, Aristotle came up with that idea that, that we now think of today. Plato is theory from the top down and Aristotle is theory from the particular to the general now called the scientific methods. Plato and Aristotle both represent instability and a search for order. Here is, here is the universe as it was changed by Alexander. What did we have there? The Greek world. And here is the world of Alexander the Great, okay? And here is Alexander. All right. Um, Plato and Alexander both represent instability and a search for order. The traditional powers are fading away and new unknown forces are taking over. And this generation of Plato and Aristotle is a me generation, a waning of the identification of the individual to the state and a tendency everywhere to put one, one's own needs before those of the state. It's the individual who matters. It's an age of rampant, wild individualism where people think the only thing that matters is the individual and that individual is me, okay? And they don't care about everybody else. Plato was trying to recreate the, the identity of the state and Aristotle developed a new theory that man is a political animal, and he redefines the state in a different way, too. Aristotle writes the politics, and this is one of your readings for tonight. Aristotle says man is a political animal. The state is intended to enable all to live, for this, live well for the sake of noble actions. Those who contribute most in noble deeds are entitled to the larger share than those superior in riches, but inferior in goodness. And now he defines people in terms of merit in a somewhat different way, in terms of goodness. And you can see this as a kind of logical development of where Plato was heading. But he also preaches something uh, that's different from Plato. Moderation, the middle way, is the path to virtue in all things, and therefore the power in the state should reside in the middle class. 
but this is all theory. Uh, Aristotle, by the way, was Alice, Alexander's teacher, and so much is made of that, but we don't know the details of what Aristotle taught him. Meanwhile, major changes were taking place in Greece. There was an extension and professionalization of the military, and Dionysius of Syracuse was one of the first to incorporate a professional engineering corps. In Syracuse, he built a splendid army, and this affected all Greece. It had the effect of outmoding the citizen soldiers. So now, whereas we had citizen soldiers in Athens and Sparta, now all of a sudden we've got a professional army. Before professionalism had been a Spartan monopoly and now other states are militarizing. An example of this is Epanamondus of Thebes. Epanamondus created the sacred band, but he did and the sacred band did nothing but train for war. In 371 at the Battle of Leuctra, Thebes wiped out Sparta. And so all of a sudden this was an extraordinary shock on Greece. Suddenly it was revealed that Sparta's strength did not lay in its morality of its military society. Sparta was shattered and with it the Peloponnesian League. But Thebes was unable to provide leadership. Well, why were these mercenary soldiers so available? One reason is because there was overpopulation. Persia had closed off the frontier in the east, and Rome was closing off the frontier in the west as it was rising. Also, uh, Epanamondus found that the hoplite was in great demand. In fact, the Persians were hiring these Greek hoplite mercenaries. In the King's Peace of 384, Persia imposed peace on Greece, and the Persian king wanted to hire Greek mercenaries. Moreover, in Greece, there was a huge growing split between the rich and the poor, okay? Enormous split in wealth and poverty, and this resulted in constant civil wars. We have class warfare going on among the Greeks. And to make things even worse, all the Greek city-states were fighting each other. So there's warfare inside the cities between the rich and the poor, and all the city-states are fighting each other. Aristotle's politics was an attempt to solve these fourth century problems with fifth century theories, but from a different approach. Aristotle said the state was a creation of nature and man is a political animal. Okay. There were other schools of thought. There were rivals to Aristotle's thought. One was Isocrates, who founded a school teaching people how to go out and govern states. And Isocrates was tremendously successful. He was a rival to Plato's theoretical solutions. Isocrates spoke with practical solutions to the problems of the day. And he wrote the Panegyrics in 380 BC as a solution to the problem. Okay. And here we see a Panamondus. And here is Isocrates. What he wrote in the Panegyrics is that anyone with a Greek education is a Greek. What he said is there should be a new attitude to what it takes to be a Greek. If you have a Greek education and if you speak Greek, then you are a Greek, even if you're not Greek by blood. Okay, this is a cultural definition of what it takes to be Greek. He changes the definition from a rigid family kinship to a cultural definition. The effect of Greece in the future is to be cultural. He suggests a program to correct overpopulation and conflict. What he says is there should be a war of revenge against Persia. And they should, the Greeks should recapture Asia Minor as an outlet for their excess population, and this war would lead to cooperation among the Greeks. The war should be led by Athens and Sparta. Okay, this is Isocrates' solution. But there is increased thinking that the future of Greece will depend on an individual rather than the state, and it's at this time that Xenophon wrote A Life of Kirush the Great. What the Greeks were looking for was a savior, some great man to come and save them from all the chaos they were living in. Well, that man was arising in Macedon or Macedonia. 
and Macedonia was growing to the north. And here we see Greece, you see Greece in the south, the yellow part here is Macedonia. It's the first large territorial state in antiquity and in Europe, and Macedonia anticipated Rome. The Macedonians were Dorians in 1200 BC. They were the same kinds of people as in the Iliad, but they had developed a dialect that couldn't be understood by the Greeks. And the, the, the Macedonians remained isolated up there in the north, separated from all the different Greeks. They couldn't even understand each other in their language. The Macedonians held on to the kingship and tribal government like that described in the Iliad, and so they were more like the archaic kings. They, they didn't develop democracy like the rest of the Greeks did. And this led them to a different concept of citizenships. The Macedonians held back the barbarians from coming into Greece. They were a buffer state against the barbarians. The Illyrians were the barbarians in modern Yugoslavia and Albania. They're, they're to the west there of our, Greeks, of our Macedonian state. In 359 BC, the Illyrians wiped out a Macedonian army and all the royal house except Philip of Macedon, who was in Thebes training with the sacred band, okay? And here we see the Illyrians are the orange part, Macedonia is the green part, here Greece is yellow. Philip II of Macedon was trained with the sacred band in Thebes. He came back to Macedonia, he built a splendid army and wiped out the Illyrians. Philip II was a practitioner of real politic, and what that means is warfare is the ultimate extension of diplomacy. And from 359 to 336 BC, he builds the Macedonian army and begins to interfere in Greek affairs. This created a conflict in Greece. Was he a savior or was he a threat? Demosthenes of Athens tried to alert the Athenians to the menace from the north. For Philip to succeed would be to end the polis. Opponents of Philip said without Philip it would end anyway. Remember, Greece was dissolving, it was crumbling and disintegrating. In 338 BC, Athens and Thebes were defeated by Philip, and Philip created the Hellenic League or the League of Corinth in 338 BC. Philip would be president and each Greek state would have a proportionate vote for foreign policy. What he did was unify Greece for the first time. And Philip made plans to make war on Persia. But in 336 BC, Philip was assassinated and there was no logic behind it. It was just an accident. It wasn't a plot. It wasn't, um, uh, it wasn't uh, um, a rebellion. He was just assassinated in, in, by a madman. When he died, Alexander, his 16-year-old son, came to the throne, I'm 19-year-old son, Alexander came to the throne at the age of 19 in 336, mostly put forward by his mother. His mother was the um, one who put him to the test. Alexander ruled for 13 years. He inherited Philip's plan, Philip's army, and his resources. Here you see Philip's state that he put together unified Greece. Here you see it in, in the context of the Persian army, Persian empire, excuse me. Alexander apparently really believed in a war of revenge against Persia and when he died in 322, the whole perspective of the Greek world had been changed. He destroyed any opportunity for the League of Corinth to succeed and the old Greek world was dwarfed. Okay, here is Greece and the Persian Empire. Here is Alexander who came to the throne. And here is Alexander's empire. Uh, let's look at, here is Alexander. Oh, I don't have one, okay. Okay, there is Alexander's empire and the old Greek world was dwarfed. What about Alexander? There are so many myths around him, we hardly know what he was like at all. Image and reality. Uh, some historians say he had a vision of uh, world unity and brotherhood, that he was a savior figure and a god. He portrayed himself as being a god. 
he called, when he conquered Egypt, the first thing he conquered was Egypt, and he immediately called himself Zeus Amon. I am a god, and the son of I am a son of a god, and my father is Zeus Amon. Okay, was he crazy to do that, or is there, or is there any rationality behind calling himself Zeus Amon? What do you think? Yeah. Didn't the the Egyptians already believe anyways that their pharaoh was their god? Yes. So it would he would be more accepted? Exactly. There's a good reason to call himself Zeus Amon. Zeus Amon would be a composite god, both Greek and, and Egyptian. Zeus is the head Greek god. Amon, uh, Amon Re is the Egyptian god. And he calls himself the son of a god. The Egyptians are used to being ruled by the son of a god. So this is a smart move, so that the Egyptians would accept him. Okay. He had a fascination for future generations. He was the model hero and conqueror. And so this is one interpretation of, of Alexander, that he had a vision of world unity and brotherhood. The other extreme is that the reality, according to Thomas Africa, was that he was a neurotic young man with a considerable military ability and extraordinary luck. He inherited the military machine from Philip and all his able generals. He was moody, emotional, and subject to fits of fury. He was neurotic and badly behaved when drunk, which was often, and he followed a pro-Persian policy okay, that alienated the Greeks. One of the things he did, he conquered the world in a really fast time, one of the things he did was force his Greek soldiers to marry Persian women, and he himself married a Persian. Roxanne was his wife. Was this smart or, or dumb? I mean, Africa is saying this is really stupid to make his Greek men marry Persian women, and it was terribly re rebellious. I mean, and just terribly, um, Incon not inconsiderate, but an understanding of what the Greeks thought for him to marry a Persian woman. Now, is he crazy by doing this, or is there any rationality between his policy with the Persians? And can anybody think of any reason behind it? Yeah. Is this like when people conquer a nation and they infiltrate their race to where they have no culture? The, like, he, since he was Greek and he conquered the Persians, he wanted to eliminate their culture and make it part of the Greek culture? Is that what he was trying to do? Um, I don't think he was trying to do that, but and that isn't what happened. But, um, but think of it as a tactic. Yeah. More like a unity? Okay. More like, a, more like um, to unify the two? Wouldn't you think that, I mean, if, if conquerors come in and they intermarry and they treat the conquered people as equals and they intermarry with them, wouldn't that, wouldn't that facilitate, you know, the, the, the control of that territory? What if we went to Iraq and, and our soldiers married Iraqi women? <laughs> I guess you could, uh, that's, that's an extreme example, but I mean, that would be the effect of it. Um, our, probably our soldiers w would never think in those terms, but Alexander was thinking in terms of assimilating the Persians into Greek culture or assimilating the Greeks into Persian culture. Doesn't matter which way, it works both ways, but it would be a way to control the Persians, which, which sheer force and military control would not. You know, it's a much more lasting way to control the people and and, and perpetuate his empire, whereas simply military force and treating them all as conquered enemies would never facilitate their, their um, assimilation. Well, the empire was huge, and he had difficulties in administer, administering it. And Thomas Africa um, accuses him of being megalomaniac, being insisted, because he insisted on being worshipped as a god. We've already said that was a, um, a reasonable tactic. The Greeks were completely contemptuous of what he was trying to do. Demosthenes said, let him be the son of Zeus and Poseidon too, if he wants. He died exhausted at the age of 32, possibly from too much drink. 
but then, and he drank enormous amounts. Um, there was an Alexander exhibit some years ago uh, that I went to, and they had craters that held wine that were like six feet tall. They were I incredibly enormous vats that they put the wine in. They drank huge amounts of wine. But this is part of the Dionysian religion. <laughs> All the Greeks drank a lot before Alexander. As, I mean, it was very Greek for him to drink a lot. He died exhausted at the age of 32 in Nebuchadnezzar's palace in Persia. And when he, on his deathbed, he said he regretted that he hadn't conquered the Western Mediterranean too. He had plans to conquer Rome. Okay. He, he vowed that he would conquer the West. When asked on his deathbed to whom he would leave his empire, he is said to have replied to the strongest. Okay. So there's a lot of myth and reality about Alexander, and we really don't know. Here's Alexander uh, fighting the Persians, um, and he married Roxanne, a Bactrian princess. Here is a blow up of that. And here is his empire. Here's a better view of his empire. He changed the entire world. He utterly reconfigured the Middle Eastern world. He linked together the Greek world and the Middle Eastern world, Egypt, Mesopotamia, all the way to India and Persia. Alexander's death was followed by a period of warfare among the generals. They could not hold his empire together, and they created a number of successor states. The age that Alexander created now that unified the entire Middle East is now called the Hellenistic Age. When we look at classical Greece, we call it the Hellenic Age, meaning classical Greece. This new world order that he created is Hellenistic. And here is Alexander hunting with the Persians. Here is the temple at Babylon where he presented daily offerings. And here is a coin that he issued. Okay. A new world order, it is Hellenistic rather than Hellenic. The new Hellenistic states were Ptolemaic Egypt, Seleucid Asia, Antigonid Greece, Pergamum, and Rhodes. And the world he created, the, and the cities he created everywhere are called cosmopolitan. Cosmopolitan means I am a citizen of the universe. And so he built cities named Alexandria all over, everywhere he conquered, and they were called a cosmopolis. Okay, and here are the successor states. None of them, all of his generals fought with each other and they broke it up into areas. But they're all Greeks and the culture that he spread everywhere is Hellenistic. Plato's, Plutarch's view on Hellenistic kings, and here's one of them. Neither seas nor mountains nor empty deserts could contain their ambitions, and the bounds which separated Europe from Asia did not confine their grandiose schemes. They could not refrain from attacking each other, for their realms lay close together and their boundaries touched. By nature, the kings were always at war, for they envied and hoped to take advantage of each other. They employed the slogans, peace and war, to serve their immediate ends and never justice. When they were temporarily unable to inflict injury upon each other, the kings talked of friendship and justice, but they were more honest when they fought openly. Is this something new? He's condemning this Hellenistic king, these Hellenistic kings. Why, they're behaving like Greeks. I mean, they're behaving just like all the other Greeks had before them. They are just Greeks. They're not different from the earlier Greeks. But the Greek polis had given way to the cosmopolis, a territorial state within a unified Greek world, and the whole Greek world was unified under Greek culture. Okay, and here, this is the region he unified, and here are some of them. The Hellenistic kings had descriptive names. The Antigonids of Macedon were called Antigonus II Doson, the unknown Antigonus II Gonatus, the Nocnid. Okay, we have the uh, Ptolemies of Egypt. Uh, the Ptolemies were nicknamed Ptolemy Sotor, which means savior. Ptolemy Philadelphus, which means sister lover. Ptolemy Eurgites, which means benefactor. Ptolemy 
Ptolemy Epiphanes, which means manifest God. Okay, these nicknames are completely Egyptian, aren't they? They're the blend of the Greeks with the Egyptians. Again, these Ptolemies of Egypt were taking on the characteristics of the pharaohs, and this is how they ruled Egypt. The Seleucids of Asia, and here are the Seleucids of Asia, are called uh, Selu Seleucus, Seleucid um, Piscon, which means fat belly, Auletus, which means flute player, Epiphanes, which means uh, granted by God. Um, a late Hellen Hellenistic writer commented acidly, no one could tell the whole story. The kings called themselves benefactor, victor, savior, or the great. Yet they switched wives like stud horses and wasted time frolicking in their harems, thumping drums, gambling in broad daylight, corrupting boys and tooting flutes in the theater. At sunrise they are still feasting, but at sunset they haven't finished breakfast. Again, this is just Greeks. They're just mean Greeks. They had notorious reputations, but the truth was that they changed wives for reasons of state. Princesses and queens were sometimes political pawns whose marriages were made and broken as corollaries of diplomacy. For example, the Egyptian queen Arsinoe II married successively Lysimachus, her half-brother Caronos, and her brother Ptolemy II. Okay, well the pharaohs practiced sister marriage. The Greeks were just taking on the Egyptian practices. But new research is showing the notable power and independence of Hellenistic women. And these women and their children often compensated by avid pursuit of luxury and debauchery. Okay. Cleopatra was a Greek princess. She was not black. She was a Greek princess, and she was one of these Greeks uh, in that line. And here is Cleopatra, again, with the Hellenistic uh, view of her. And here are the Ptolemies. Okay, the Ptolemies ruled Egypt. Egypt had a long bureaucratic tradition, and the Ptolemies took it over and ruled it more tightly and squeezed more enormous revenues from it than any ancient society. Okay. Egypt was the richest country in the entire ancient world, and the Ptolemies milked it dry. It was a wonderful economic machine. They just reaped all the taxes. Alexandria was the largest and most impressive city in the Hellenistic world. It had 300,000 free inhabit inhabitants, and it played an international role. And what happened was there was a new wave of colonization. Old Greece, remember the tiny area of Greece, had huge overpopulation. What happened was Greeks migrated in huge waves and populated all the conquered territories. And so in addition to conquering all of this area, Greeks spread out all over it. They were a ruling class who spread over the Hellenistic world in a veneer of rule over it. The Ptolemies favored the Greeks over the natives, and so did all the other rulers. Uh, in, in Egypt, for example, the cult of the Ptolemies as god kings was cultivated in the Egyptian tradition, and they practiced sister marriage. Under the patronage of the Ptolemies, Alexandria became the intellectual center of the Mediterranean world, and the great library and museum at Alexandria became the wonder of the world. To finance it, they levied heavy taxes and, and farmed Egypt. As in ancient Egypt, the king owned all the land and took a large share of everything. We have similar development among the Seleucids of Asia. Uh, they lost a lot of their land pretty quickly. What developed was a melting pot society that spread throughout the entire Hellenistic world. All the cultures were medging to, uh, melting together. Diogenes made the statement, I am a cosmopolitis, I am a citizen of the world. Okay, and here are some of these Hellenistic cities. Uh, a Greek veneer of aristocracy was overlaid on the native cultures. Uh, the, uh, the aristocrats were literate and they lived in these Hellenistic cities. They spoke a common language over all of the Hellenistic world called the Koine Greek, and they built cities everywhere. Remember, they were Greeks, they had a city culture, and they built cities all over the whole world, many of them named 
Alexandria. Uh, some of the major cities of the Hellenistic world were Alexandria, Antioch, and Rhodes. Pergamum on Asia Minor was a model of success in Hellenistic power politics. Again, they had deified kings like the Ptolemies on a smaller scale. Rhodes, the city of Rhodes, was the wonder of the Hellenistic world, and there was a colossal statue of Apollo 120 feet high over the harbor. They were at the commercial crossroads of the Mediterranean and functioned as a center of world banking. The navy of Rhodes cleared the sea of pirates, and they were the most respected of the Hellenistic state. Okay, let's look at this cosmopolitan world. Here is Pergamum, the Hellenistic city in Asia Minor. that was a center of trade and commerce and education with Greeks, a Greek aristocracy ruling the city, as in all of these cities. Here, and here is another of these Hellenistic cities. It's a cosmopolitan world. The Greek idea of the individual and man's power in the world is eclipsed. People were now at the mercy of forces they could not control and pawns of fate. We have a new mass society because men are no longer involved in the political process except as armies, okay? As citizens of the enlarged Greek world, individuals felt lost in the cosmos, insecure and unstable. And here's the city of Alexandria as a plan of a house of a wealthy, wealthy Greek in the Hellenistic age, a new wealthy Greek middle class bent on conspicuous consumption. They had a very high standard of living, at least the aristocrats did. They filled their houses with art and luxury goods of all kinds, okay, and this, this um, culture, this Greek culture spread over this entire Middle Eastern world all the way to India. Uh, here are the Seleucids, the, um, the, the state. The response was new developments in philosophy and religion, okay. Demetrius of Phalerum said, one does not need endless years or many generations to see the severity of Tyche or fate. 50 years are enough. Do you think that 50 years ago, either the Persians and their king or the Macedonians and their king, if some god had prophesied the present time, would ever have believed that even the name of Persia, which then controlled the world, would perish and that the unknown Macedonians would rule the world. Yet Tyche keeps no bargains with mortals and always frustrates our reason with unexpected blows. Tyche always pr proves her power by crushing our hopes and even now she has made it clear to all men that she has only lent the good fortune of Persia to Macedon until she decides to snatch it away again. So what we have is fate, a new worship of fate and a new fear of fate, okay? We also have Awed by the workings of chance, many Greeks tried to appease Tyche or fate with re religious life. Uh, um, other religions arose, um, philosophies arose, religions arose. There was loss of the self in the cult of Dionysius, the, the drunken cult. The, there were attempts to cope through philosophy, and we have a rise of three philosophies. Epicureanism, Stoicism, and Cynicism were the three philosophies by which people hoped to cope. Epicureanism was escapism or withdrawal preached by Epicurus of Samos. He preached the absence of pain as the only reasonable goal of human life and advocated quiet living to reduce suffering and philosophy to bring peace of mind, not the pursuit of pleasure, which some people think. In a world of slavery and insecurity, Epicurus counseled calm in the face of calamity, dignity, dignified acceptance of pain in a universe of atoms and emptiness. Zeno of Cyprus preached Stoicism. What he said was that divine providence controlled the universe through the stars, and that's the core of his philosophy. Divine providence imparted insights into the nature of truth, and he said there was an absolute moral standard for all men, 
Sin was any act or thought which violated the law of the universe. He had a universal philosophy. Instead of living in separate cities or nations with their parochial ideas of justice, we should realize that all men belong to the same city and folk with one life and one order, just as a grazing herd shares a common pasture. He preaches the brotherhood of man, but limited, only the good could, could participate. The third philosophy is Diogenes who preached cynicism, and this is bitter rebellion, withdrawal, and individualism. Cynic is the word for dog. They were called dogs because they barked at everyone in, with criticism, okay? They criticized everyone. They defied the conventions of society and demanded a return to nature. It's militant individualism. They rejected conformity and authority. And in fact, there's this famous uh, story about um, Diogenes bathing in the middle of the, of the street of the city. They rationalized poverty into a virtue and they were anarch anarchistic Puritans. They disdained society and worldly success and attacked prominent men. Cynicism offered an alternative life of protest to sensitive men who had lost faith in society. We also see the rise of new mystery religions. There's a revival in Zoroastrianism and the religion of Isis, which both promised life after death, uh, savior gods and goddesses. There were changes in Judaism. We now have Hellenistic Judaism, where the book of Ecclesiastes is strongly influenced by the Greeks. It expresses the pessimism of the age. Vanity of vanities, all is vanity. There's a time to live and a time to die, a time to rejoice and a time to mourn, a time to sow and a time to reap. Okay, again, the sort of pessimism and acceptance of your fate that we see in this Hellenistic world. We have this cosmopolitan society, all speaking the Koine Greek, the museum over the home of the muses is flourishing in the city of Athens. This is Tyche. And here is Epicurus. We, we have these new philosophies. Okay, I've already had that. Art undergoes a huge revolution. Instead of being idealistic as in classical Greek, it becomes extremely emotional over-realistic, exaggerated realism is characteristic of Hellenistic art, emotional and dramatic. This is the kind of art we see all over the empire. Here's the lighthouse of the harbor of Alexandria uh, in these huge Hellenistic cities, the Colossus of Rome. It's the golden age of science. Uh, paradoxically, we have the flourishing of sciences in this new age of Hellenistic Greece. Okay, Aristotle's disciples were the peripatetics who were wandering scientists. Okay, now we've looked at Hellenistic Greece. Next week we'll look at Rome.